Hi, and welcome to According to Pete for March. Today, I want to talk about resonance and uh, resonant circuits and what that means and such. Uh, it's probably gonna be a long one, so we probably should dry, uh, not drive, dive right in. So let's do it. Okay, so to start this off, uh, we should talk about the difference between resistance and impedance, okay? Resistance is associated with real power burn, okay? A resistor, if you put a voltage across it, it will draw a current and it will dissipate power. Uh, impedance, um, impedance is a resistance to, uh, <laughs> I'm using the same term, uh, is a resistance specifically to AC current flow. And it presents an opposition, but you get your power back out of those components, right? And impedance is made up of reactances, uh, inductive reactance and capacitive reactance. Why is it called a reactance? Because you get your power back out of it, kind of like I said. Anyway, um, these two things, they are measured in ohms, reactances. You have inductive reactance, which is uh, X sub L equals two pi F L, and it is in ohms, as I said. Uh, and a capacitive reactance, which is X sub C equals one over two pi F C. Now, as you can see, these are frequency dependent items, right? Resistance, not frequency dependent. It's always a resistor, all right? These things, they change their values in reactance according to frequency. Okay, Eli the Iceman, what does that actually mean? What you should read that as, or how you should read that is uh, for an inductor, L, Voltage, E, leads current, okay? Now what that means graphically, and I'll just, uh, uh, if you apply a voltage, that voltage is immediately going to be seen across the inductor. So this is T equals zero, starts uh, As time goes forward, the current will slowly start to ramp up, okay? So the voltage is gonna start high and it's gonna go down, and the current is gonna start low and it's gonna go up, okay? And in fact, they're 90 degrees out of phase. Um, now for, a cap, the way you should read this is for the capacitor, current leads voltage, okay? So, same plot, only voltage and current are reversed, okay? So these two components actually work out of phase with each other. And that becomes quite critical at a frequency that's called resonance. Uh, this is a Bode plot, which you may or may not be familiar with. Hopefully you've seen a Bode plot before. Um, this is a plot of logarithmic frequency versus logarithmic ohms, okay, dB ohm. 180 microhenry inductor I've got, and I've got a 333 picofarad cap, and what that actually is, is three nanofarad, <laughs> three one nanofarad caps in series, and when I draw the circuit for you, it'll sort of make sense what I'm doing. With regard to resonance, um, what we're talking about here, let's say you've got a cap, or a, uh, uh, yeah, cap, 333 picofarad, um, and the way you do this plot is you figure out what its capacitive reactance is at a given frequency, okay? Uh, for my purposes, and you can almost see that that's a C, um, I calculated at 10 kilohertz, and this is one over two pi FC, so, Capacitor reactance, that's the, that's the formula, gets me 47,794 ohms at 10 kilohertz, which if you back it out uh, for dB ohms, and the value uh, uh, equation here is 20 log times your reactance value, you get 94 dB, okay? So what I do is I plot a point 94 dB and a single cap on this plot decreases at a rate of 20 dB ohm per decade, okay? So I can just take that single point, I could draw a line. That's pretty cool. Now, uh, the inductor, same thing, only it goes the other direction, okay? So I calculate my uh, inductive reactance at 10 kilohertz, because that's where I started my plot, and I came up with 11.3 um, ohms at 10 kilohertz, which if you throw it into the dB ohm formula, gives you 21 dB ohm. Okay, and then you draw that line at 20 dB per decade going up because a cap, uh, uh, sorry, inductor starts at a very low resistance at DC, like zero, and then increases uh, with frequency, okay? I've got my two lines here, and then I've got this point. That point is called resonance. What this shows you is that this is the point where 
the reactances are the same, okay? Um, and that's important, but it might be more helpful to think of it as the point where each component is holding the same amount of energy, okay? And in fact, it's really cool when you get when you get a couple of, when you get a cap and, a, and an inductor together and you ping it, you can actually watch the electricity slosh from component to component at the resonant frequency. And that really leads to some cool stuff. Now, let's talk about Q for a second. Think of Q as how much energy you can get back out of a reactive circuit. Uh, in terms of the circuit we're looking at today, we want a very high Q value because I'm, I'm ultimately going for an oscillation. And for an oscillation, you want a high Q value. Now, you can reduce Q to component values. So in a series RLC circuit, which is resistor, inductor, capacitor, and there's always resistance, even if it's parasitic, uh, Q can be reduced to root of L over C divided by R, okay? In a parallel circuit, Q can be reduced to your R times root of C over L. It's, it's, it's not necessarily a hard and fast thing, it's sort of a reference. Like, what sort of behavior can you expect from a circuit? And it doesn't just apply to, um, you know, the, the sort of thing here. It has an application, I mean, the application in filtering um, and various zillions of other things. And it all depends on context, and Q can be defined in a lot of different ways. So that's why I say, in general, think of it as how much energy you can get back out of a circuit. High Q, you get a lot of energy back out. Also means that it's gonna ring, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Now, dampening uh, is uh, what you get by throwing this R in there, okay? And what it is, is uh, certain values of Q are referred to as being uh, underdamped or critically damped or overdamped. Specifically, if you've got a Q value that is under one half, it's considered to be overdamped. And I'll show you what that means in a sec. If you've got a Q value of exactly one half, it's considered to be critically damped. If you've got a Q value that's over one half, it's considered underdamped. All right, now what that means is that if you've got a resonant circuit and you ping it with a step function, for an underdamped circuit, what you'll see is the voltage will rise right away and then it will, it'll ring a lot, okay? Now, for an underdamped circuit, what you'll get is a slow rise to steady state. So it's very much damped. It's not allowed to move around a lot. Now, a critically damped system is the combination of the two. What you'll see is a response quickly, and then it will quickly settle to its steady state, okay? That's called critically damped. Just for reference, uh, a critically damped system that you may or may not be familiar with is your car suspension, okay? And I love this. A car suspension is a low-pass filter that's critically damped, right? So you see people going over railroad tracks, and they want to go really slow. When they go really slow, all that low-frequency stuff gets passed to your butt, and you don't want that, right? So I'm in the back going, why aren't you driving faster? Anyway, critically damped system. Uh, provided your car is not like a 1970 Cutlass or something like that. This is the place where the impedances are the same, uh, the reactances rather, uh, they're both holding the same energy. But remember, Eli the Iceman, okay? Now because a cap and an inductor are working at opposing phases, some really crazy stuff happens. If you look at the plot, you go like, oh, okay, so this goes to there, which is 50-some-ish uh, dB ohm. And so you would expect, um, the, if you had like an inductor and a cap and then ground, uh, you, maybe you can see that, that if you measured, if you had a signal going in here and at resonance, you would expect the impedance at this point to ground to be maybe twice that. It's not. In fact, what happens is the impedance goes to zero. For a series of uh, 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 resonant circuit, what will actually happen is you're looking at the peak facing down, and for a high Q value, what you'll see is it will actually dip quite low. And the more Q the circuit has, the lower that's going to go. Now, for a parallel circuit, it's going to be just the opposite. It's going to peak the other way. 
And in fact, uh, <laughs> yeah, this pretty much describes it all. I mean, this is, this is like a notch filter. If I were to sweep the frequency from zero up to whatever, at the frequency of resonance, which is about 650 kilohertz calculated, you're gonna get zero from, from there to ground, assuming there's like a resistor over here or something, okay. Parallel circuit, just the opposite. It will go to a very high impedance. All right, so enough talking about impedances, because what I'm actually driving towards is a resonant high Q circuit, okay? Now, as I said before, if a resonant circuit has a very high Q, it rings and it rings a lot, okay? But it doesn't ring forever. There's always an R, be it parasitics. I mean, it, there's right, every inductor is going to have a DC resistance associated with it. So no matter how good of a Q you've got, it's always gonna taper off unless you put it in an amplifying circuit and you give it a little bit of bump with some positive feedback and then you get an oscillator. That's where we're going because oscillators are fun. Now there's a bunch of different ways to make oscillators these days. You can make them with a, 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 a crystal. You can just, we, we sell a signal generator on the website that you can just program and say, make a sine wave of this and it will do this. But that's not very much fun because that doesn't use a physical process to make a thing. And I love physical processes that make things. There are basically two camps of uh, inductor capacitor based oscillators. Uh, there is Hartley, which is so named for Ralph Hartley, who uh, designed uh, one in 1915. And then there is Edwin Colpitts, who designed a different one in 1918, okay? The difference between these two is that a Hartley oscillator uses a split inductance for feedback and uh, the Colpitts oscillator uses a split capacitance for feedback, which is easier for me to do because I don't feel like winding uh, inductors, okay? Um, let me show you what I'm talking about. This is a Colpitts oscillator. Um, as you see, uh, this is the feedback, all right? So your signal comes out here and you've got feedback here and it's a split capacitance for uh, the feedback. That's what makes it a Colpitts, okay? Now, there's like a zillion different configurations of a Colpitts oscillator. This is one of the ones that you will find pretty close to the top if you do a Google search for Colpitts. I only have 180 microenvy inductors, aside from something that I wind myself, but uh, that's what I used here. I actually used three caps. Now, now let, me, let me explain this a little bit. The ratio of this capacitance to this capacitance is what gives your feedback, okay? And you can vary this to get, you can tune a little bit to get uh, both the right frequency uh, and a, a decent sine wave out of it. And also to adjust the, 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 the value of your sine wave, how big it is. For calculating purposes, uh, to calculate the frequency of this thing, we're interested in that guy and we're interested in these guys. We're not interested in that guy. Why do I say that? Um, because number one, the inductor's not connected to that one through a direct path, and these are, okay? Not only that, but that thing is like three orders of magnitude larger than these. So that one's out of the picture. Not only that, it's found on the base of the transistor, and I know that a cap on the base of a transistor is usually there to keep noise off of the base and let this thing run without a lot of interference. <laughs> interference. So when you calculate this thing, remember that when you add uh, caps in series, it's like adding resistors in parallel. So the net effect of this, one nan, one nan, one nan, uh, divided by three, you get uh, about 333 picofarad. So when you calculate 180 microhenry and 330 picofarad, you get mm, about 650 kilohertz. Now in my sample circuit, I don't get quite 650 kilohertz. And part of the reason, probably all the reason, is all the parasitics that I've introduced by using uh, long leaded components and using a breadboard. <laughs> but it does oscillate and it's pretty cool. So here's my Colpitz oscillator, all right? These are the two caps on the low side towards ground that I described. There's the high one, there's the inductor, there's my 3904. It might be a 2222, but they're effectively the same, so I'm not too worried about it. The cap that was on the base of the transistor, I actually yanked that out because it was kind of jacking with my, my, my sign. I found I got a better signal out with that. Not present, so I yanked it. 
Also, the reason for the difference uh, in the ratio between the caps is because I was getting a little bit of a shark fin on my sine wave. And as you can see, the sine wave now is really clean, uh, and that's a result of picking the ratio, which is sort of a two to one thing, or a one to two thing they added. So anyway, uh, so this is oscillating, and as you can kind of see, well, you'll never be able to see this, but let me, let me show you the cooler thing. You'll notice I've got a wire wrapped around this guy, okay? Why is that? Because I've got a radio, okay? Uh, part of the reason also for selecting the caps the way I did is because I wanted to get them in the frequency range of this radio. Um, the radio I have is actually uh, AM and shortwave, and it covers a whole bunch of different bands, and you can pick this oscillator up on the radio. As you can see, I got my radio here. This says uh, somewhere below 600 kilohertz. You can't trust this dial. Uh, my scope says I'm actually resonating at 583-ish kilohertz, so less than my 650 that I calculated, but mm, same order of magnitude. We're going to take it. Okay. Now, this thing is set to register continuous wave, CW, right? And that oscillator is making a fairly decent carrier wave. Now, this is not an AM transmitter, right? So I don't have to worry about breaking any FCC laws. This is just an oscillator on a breadboard. And I've taken the antenna, which is almost certainly for dual lead, and I've coiled it around, and I've wrapped the wire around, so I'm cheating. But this is a radio, and it's picking that up. Now, how unstable is this? A little bit. Check it out. <laughs> I'm changing the inductance by putting the screwdriver near to the inductor, right? So this is not a particularly stable oscillator, but it's a fun toy to play with, and it has immediate applications in the real world. And that is very cool. I totally recommend that you try this out. Uh, the components are, holy cow, that's awful. But the components are very easily come by. You got the 2N3904 transistor, you got a pair of 10Ks, you got a 2.2K, and some caps, and an inductor. And you can wind your own inductor, okay? Uh, get, get a spool of magnet wire, like 28 or 30 gauge magnet wire, uh, something for a core. I used a coat hanger, and there are a lot of purists who are going to go, oh, you can't use that. It's going to get eddy currents. Yes, you're going to get eddy currents. Whatever. Spit up a coil. See what it does. Um, and play with it. And if you have one of these, play with this too. Now, like I said, this is not a transmitter, not AM, not CW, but it, you could make it into that. I mean, all I got to do is turn on and off power for this thing, and that is a continuous wave transmitter. Provided I give it a little bit of boost and attach an antenna, blah, 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 blah. But I'm not advocating you do that because, in effect, it is against the law. The FCC does have uh, some guidelines about that, so you don't want to go breaking any rules that you shouldn't be breaking. So that's it for uh, resonant circuits and a uh, quick oscillator thing. I definitely recommend you play with this. I definitely recommend you try winding your own inductors because that's always fun to see something work or not work. Go educate yourself. Put your comments or questions uh, down in the comment section below. Or alternately, you can email us at feedback at sparkfun.com with, according to Pete in the subject line, it will get to me. Someone will go rah, 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 and then I will do something with it. See you next time. Bye. Do it. That's it. I got nothing else to say. Get lost. <laughs> That's definitely going in the video. <laughs> Another?